Okay, uh, welcome everybody. I'm uh, delighted to begin this uh, session. My name is uh, Irit Dinur. I'm a computer scientist and mathematician from the Weizmann Institute. And I have the honor to be the moderator for this uh, session. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Maria Florina Balkan. Uh, she's a theoretical computer scientist who uh, works mainly on machine learning and artificial intelligence from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, she's one of the leaders in, uh, in this uh, field. She has been co-chair of all the leading conferences, NeurIPS and COLT and ICML. She also organized the Simon's Semester on Foundations of Machine Learning. And she will tell us today about uh, putting formal foundations for data-driven algorithms. Uh, the video itself will be a, a recorded video. It's very early in the morning in uh, Nina's uh, location. And she will be available live uh, on Discord for questions after the lecture. We won't really have time for a, for a, a video Q&A session. So the floor is yours. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. For, I'm delighted to give a talk uh, at ICM. And uh, the, the topic of my talk today will be uh, on learning theoretic foundations of uh, data-driven algorithm design. Okay, and let me start with a high-level overview uh, of the work on data-driven algorithm design for solving combinatorial problems. First of all, let's think about uh, learning algorithms for solving algorithmic or optimization problems that involve discrete or combinatorial structures where the inputs or the outputs might be combinatorial. So for example, uh, the problem of clustering or organizing a new set of items into natural groups, or the problem of pricing a given set of items in order to maximize revenue. Now such problems, and in fact, most combinatorial problems are hard within the classic analysis frameworks. Uh, and now in these classic frameworks, in these frameworks that are classic in the theory of computing, uh, we assume that the algorithm designer designs the algorithm, the algorithm analytically by hand. So the algorithm will be hand designed. And from an analysis point of view, we impose that the algorithm must succeed even for solving, even in worst case instances. But is the algorithm must succeed for solving even just the one time, uh, one shot, worst case instance of uh, the underlying algorithm problem. Now, while this worst case framework has been the backbone of algorithm research and applications since the field inception, unfortunately for many problems, the types of guarantees you can obtain in this classic framework are often weak, either for solution quality or for running time or for other performance measures. And as a consequence, in recent years, Rather than using hand-designed algorithms with only weak worst-case guarantees, it has become increasingly common across many different fields to use a data-driven algorithm design approach. That means we consider large families of parameterized uh, algorithms and use machine learning and the training set of problem instances from a specific domain in order to determine an algorithm that does well on instances from that given domain. Now, this idea has been um, used across uh, different communities, including artificial intelligence, computational biology, algorithmic game theory. And in fact, several uh, breakthroughs uh, in these areas are, are due to this data-driven algorithm design approach. However, quite surprisingly, up until very recently, there has been very little theoretical understanding of this approach, asking the question of what kind of formal guarantees, theoretical guarantees we can hope to prove for this data-driven algorithms. And in the past five years or so, we've uh, uh, several of my students and collaborators, we have developed a series of tools for providing uh, performance guarantees uh, for uh, this data driven algorithm design approach. And we started by looking at various case studies coming from so algorithms families relevant to problems coming from artificial intelligence, data science, computational biology, Algorithm game theory and so on. So we started by looking at several case studies, but by and after analyzing these case studies, and we also provided some general principles for analyzing data-driven algorithms. 
And it did so by using both statistical learning theory formalization and an online learning theory uh, formalization. And what I think it's quite exciting is that both line, but this line of work impacts both algorithm design uh, and analysis. So it pushes both the boundaries of algorithm analysis and design because it provides principal tools for uh, data driven algorithms. But at the same time, it also pushes the boundaries of machine learning and in particular the boundaries of machine learning theory because now we consider learning much more complex objects beyond simple classifiers as uh, typically done um, um, in machine learning. Okay, and today uh, I will specifically focus on um, presenting general analysis tools uh, rather than going on and discussing specific case studies. Uh, and in particular, I'm focusing on explaining how uh, this line of work uh, helps us to push boundaries of machine learning theory. Uh, and I'm doing so uh, hoping to get mathematicians interested in uh, this area as well. Okay, so this is a high level overview. Now I'm going to go into technical details. Uh, and uh, to phrase, so, so to phrase, um, and so I'll start by using a statistical learning theory formalization. Oh, and I want to say that some of the, a lot of the work that I'll present, um, so the work that I'll present in the talk today is based on work joined to several of, of many of my students and collaborators. And on the slide, I have the references to the corresponding uh, papers. Um, but also acknowledges the, the co-authors. Okay, so now going into details, um, to phrase the data algorithm design as a machine learning problem, in particular a statistical learning theory problem, we're going to use a framework introduced by uh, Rishi Gupta and Tim Graf Garden in ITCS 2016. So what we're going to do, we're going to fix an algorithm problem, say subset selection or clustering, so fix the algorithm problem, then we'll denote by pi the set of problem instances for this problem, and then we also fix uh, a family of algorithms, which I'm going to denote by ALB. Uh, we'll also fix a family of algorithms which I'll, uh, which I'll denote by ALB. And we're going to assume that this family of algorithms is parameterized by a parameter set P, which is a subset of RD. And in particular, I'll denote by alpha the algorithm in the family that is parameterized by the parameter alpha in P. And then, of course, we'll also fix a utility function. Uh, U goes from the Cartesian product of pi and p um, to the interval 0 h and u uh, of i and alpha simply measures the performance of algorithm a alpha on the problem instance i and then we can also denote uh, uh, by u alpha for any fixed parameter alpha we can also denote by u alpha the function the utility function that goes from the set of problem instances to the range to the bounded range 0 h uh, and this is the utility uh function u alpha induced by a given algorithm a alpha and naturally u alpha of i which is the performance of algorithm a alpha on this psi is u of i and alpha okay as an example uh, let's consider the classic map set problem so an instance here uh i consists of n items uh and each item i has value of the i and size as i and we also have a map set capacity c and then the goal is to select the most valuable subset of items uh, whose total size does not exceed C. So we want to select the most valuable set of subset of items that fit in the knapsack. So we want to find the subset B that maximizes the value of the set subject to these capacity constraints. And uh, a natural family of greedy algorithms for this problem, which is introduced in the paper by Rishi Gupta and Dean Rathgarden, is a family of greedy algorithms parameterized by uh, uh, R. Uh, so the R in our, uh, by, uh, so the parameter set is a real line. And for any alpha uh, in this parameter set P, well, the algorithm A alpha is defined as follows. So we're going to set the set score um, for each item i to be vi over si to the power of alpha. And then what we're going to do in decreasing order of the score, we're going to add each item to the next set if there is enough capacity left. And then naturally, we're going to define uh, ui of alpha, to be, which is the utility of algorithm uh, A alpha on instance i to be just the value of this items chosen by the algorithm parameterized by alpha on the given input instance i okay and this is just an example going back to the general model as i said we, in the context earlier in the context of data driven algorithm design what we want to do we want to find an algorithm that does well on instances that come from our specific domain uh, rather than focusing on uh, worst case instances 
And in this distributional statistical learning formalization of the problem, the application specific domain is modeled uh, by an unknown distribution D over uh, high, over the set of possible instances. And when the learning algorithm uh, is given n IID samples, uh, I1, I2, IN drawn IID from this distribution, and we assume that it can measure the performance of any algorithm in the family on any of these input training samples. And then the goal of the algorithm is to use these training samples to find an algorithm A alpha from the family that will be used on future inputs coming from the same distribution B. And mathematically, the goal uh, of the learning algorithm is to output an algorithm from our algorithm's family ALG that performs almost as well as the optimal algorithm A alpha star with respect to the fixed unknown distribution. And what is this optimal algorithm A alpha star is respect to the fixed unknown distribution is the algorithm that maximizes its expected utility over, uh, over a, an instance drawn at random from the underlying distribution D. So it's an algorithm from the family that maximizes the expected utility over an instance drawn at random from the underlying distribution. The same distribution from which the training set of typical instances has been drawn. Now, a natural approach uh, for solving this problem is to just find an algorithm I had from the family, but as over the training set of typical instances. But now, of course, this brings a key question, which is what we call in machine learning theory a sample complexity question, which asks how large should the training set of typical instances be in order to guarantee that. Uh, a good performance over the training set of typical instances translates to good performance on your instances as well. Okay. And now the cool fact is that we can build on tools from statistical learning theory to provide sample complexity, uniform convergence bounds for these settings. Okay. And we know from learning theory uh, that if we are able to bound the intrinsic complexity, which is a learning theoretic measure of how intrinsically complex the class of algorithms is. So if you are able to bound the intrinsic complexity, uh, then we can immediately provide uniform convergence bounds of the form that I have here on the slide, um, which quantify how many typical instances to so suffice to get uniform convergence and as a consequence, uh, good generalization. Okay, and if you've never seen them, uh, roughly speaking, these bounds are bound uh, on the number of training samples we need to see um, in the training phase in order to guarantee that with high probability over the draw of the training set of typical instances, we have it uniformly for all algorithms A alpha in our family of algorithms. Um, we have it, uh, that average performance, the average utility over, uh, we have it for any such algorithm, that average utility over the training set of typical instances is close, say epsilon close to, um, uh, to their uh, expected performance, the expected utility over the underlying distribution. By the way, here this should be the dimension of the, the dimension of the class of functions u alpha. That here should be the class of functions u alpha. And um, the, the exciting thing is that once you have uniform convergence, enough samples to get uniform convergence, this then implies that if we output an algorithm that does over, well over the training set of typical instances, We'll also, it will also do well on new uh, random instances from the same source. And in particular, we completed the best algorithm from the family with respect to the fixed unknown distribution. So it will compete with that algorithm A alpha star that I defined on the previous slide, on the previous slide. Okay, so really it turns out that uh, the key quantity um, in this, and so, and it turns out that the key quantity in this uniform convergence sample complexity bound is this, uh, dimension notion of dimension for the family of functions at hand okay and there are several notions uh from learning theory could use for example what we use in our work that Suna mentioned and all these notions really what they quantify is the ability of the functions in the given function class to fit complex patterns because the more complex patterns we can fit the more samples we need to obtain uniform convergence and as a consequence generalization and um one is of town to talk about today is a major uh, uh, major result in this stock 2021 paper that I mentioned here on the slides, joined with several collaborators. Um, and uh, so in this work, we give a very general technique for analyzing the pseudo dimension of the family of functions that we really care about, which is uh, this function in the context of the general design. These are these utility functions U alpha. Um, as a function of the, so we give a technique for analyzing the utility, uh, the, the two dimension of the family of functions, um, which are utility functions given by 
U alpha given by our uh, parametric algorithms. And this technique exploits the structure of the uh, dual class of functions for providing the precision dimension of, of uh, this uh, prime on this primal class of functions, which is the function class of interest. Okay, and what do I mean by this? So um, we want to bound the pseudo dimension, as we've seen earlier. What we want to do is we want to bound the pseudo dimension of the class of utility functions parameterized by uh, a parameter vector alpha. So every function in the family is specified by a value of alpha. And it's now a part, uh, so it's specified by a value of alpha, as I have here, and it's a function of all possible inputs. Right? So this is the function class whose, whose pseudo dimension I want to bound. But uh, it turns out that to, to, we have a technique that takes adventure, uh, that takes advantage of the structure of the dual class. Now, what are these functions in the dual class? These functions in the dual class are now parameterized by input vectors. So these are possible input instances of the algorithm problem. And they take as input uh, possible, uh, all the possible parameters alpha. So a function on the dual goes from the set of uh, parameters to the bound is a zero h. And it's uh, a fun ui, for example, a function of du dual is induced by a given fixed uh, instance i, and ui of alpha is just the utility of the algorithm i alpha on the input instance i. So for functions in the primal, I, or function u alpha in the primal, I fix the parameter alpha and I arrange the possible inputs. Um, right? So for function in the primal, I fix the parameter alpha and arrange overall possible inputs. For a function the dual, I fix an instance of the algorithm problem and I range overall possible parameters. And we really, to get the generalization guarantees for data driven algorithm design, we really care about the bounding of the dimension of the primal class of functions. And the exciting fact is that we give a technique that expresses the structure of the dual class of functions. And now, our key motivation uh, for doing so is that it turns out that uh, we can often show that the class of dual functions these functions ui are structured so for example for the knapsack problem it was shown uh, uh that uh, for that uh if we consider the family of greedy algorithms that i gave as an example earlier then these dual functions are piecewise linear uh where you know so where we with the most n squared pieces you know and this uh this uh, transition boundaries even have a very specific form or as another example, for uh, uh, in uh, in a couple of uh, papers in 2017 and like 2020 mentioned here on the slides, we show that uh, if we're considering a uh, parametric family of linkage procedures for solving clustering problems, again these dual functions are piecewise linear. Uh, a couple more examples. So uh, if we're considering uh, solving partitioning problems that can be written as integer quadratic programs, like the MaxCut problem, and if we're considering uh, parametric families of uh, Algorithms that look like semi definite programming plus randomized um, rounding, but this is parametric rounding, then these dual functions uh, are, uh, look, um, are piecewise, in, uh, in piecewise inversely quadratic. The corresponding dual functions are piecewise inversely quadratic. Or, yet, as another example, if we, uh, we looked at problems coming from algorithmic game theory in economics and a variety of pricing problems, such as posted prices, two part tariffs. Parametric VCG, parameterized VCG auctions. And in all of these cases, the dual functions turned out to be piecewise linear. Now in high dimensions, because you know, we might have multiple uh, items for sale and we might have multiple combinatorial uh, buyers. And so, um, you know, motivated by such case studies, then we uh, came up with this general theorem for analyzing the sample complexity as a function uh, of the function class we really care about. It's a function of the structure of the dual class of functions. And this is down to tell you about uh, in a bit, but uh, before, uh, and actually uh, before doing so, um, you know, uh, just to tell you a little bit more about the story. So after uh, proving several sample complexity theorems for these specific settings, we thought it would be good to also abstract out a, a general theorem that can be used to provide sample complexity results in terms of uh, a nice structure properties of the dual class of functions. And this is, I think, useful because it allows us to kind of uh, decouple the statistical aspects uh, of the more uh, structure, the statistical aspects that lead to generalization bounds of the more structural uh, uh, aspects of the problem, which are very specific to the problem. And another nice thing is that the proof is actually quite slick. And so once we have abstract out and we have the right level of abstraction, actually the, the whole uh, the proof becomes clearer and simpler. 
and I want to show you kind of an overview of the proof. But before doing so, um, I, uh, to make sure that we're on the same page, I'm going to uh, give a very quick overview of what this uh, pseudo-dimension is, or that measure of complexity pseudo-dimension actually is. And uh, before doing so, I want to just start by defining this dimension, which is a measure of complexity for binary group function classes. So it's a classic notion. So what is a this dimension? Uh, the this dimension of a function class H is just a card, which is a class of binary valued functions. It's just a cardinality of the larger set S that can be labeled in all possible two to the size S ways by functions in the function class H. And by the way, this will be called shattering of the set S. And uh, for example, just if we can, if H is a class of linear separators in the plane, then the this dimension is three, uh, because if we place three points in a triangle, as I have here in the figure, um, then we can produce all possible eight labelings by using linear separators. But no matter how we place four points in the plane, there will be at least one labeling that cannot be achieved by linear separators. Now, the class, the function, uh, the functions of interest for us are actually real value functions as utility functions of algorithms. Um, and so we need a measure of uh, complexity for real value functions. And two dimension is an actual extension of VC dimension to real value functions. And what is a two dimension of a function class F of real value functions is just the size of the largest set S of examples that can be shattered in a real value sense. So what do I mean by this? The pseudo dimension of a function class F is just the cardinality of the largest set S of examples, which is the cardinality of the largest set X1, X2, Xn of examples, along with thresholds Y1, Y2, Y1, Yn, such that all two to the N uh, above below patterns uh, can be achieved by functions in the function class um, F. So for example, if N equals two, then there should exist a function F1 that achieves the below below pattern. So that means F1 of X1 is smaller than Y1, F1 of X2 is smaller than Y2. There should exist a function F2 that achieves the above below pattern, a function F3 that achieves the below above pattern, and the function F4 that achieves the above above pattern. And um, this is quite natural. And if you think about it, the two dimension of F is actually the this dimension of a related uh, below the graph, uh, um, you know, class, which is a binary uh, class of functions related to F. So it's a, quite a natural notion. OK, now the interesting fact is that actually we can provide uniform convergence. It's a classic fact. We can provide uniform convergence generalization bounds for uh, classes of real valued functions based on the notion of the pseudo dimension. And uh, roughly speaking, we can provide upper bounds. So this upper bound over here uh, uh, on how much the true expectation um, of a function f deviates from its empirical average, and uh, this upper bound holds with high probability, and moreover, it holds uniformly for all functions in the function class. And then these upper bounds now depend on the pseudo dimension of the function class of interest, and um, uh, on um, uh, and on the, on the sample size and the confidence parameter delta. And this is one way to write this. Uh, Uniform convergence bounds, another way is the way I had it earlier on the sample, oh, on the slides. There are identical ways to write the bounds. Okay, so now this, we, uh, given this quick overview of, uh, of, of two dimension is, now let me go back and describe our general result uh, for upper bounding uh, the two dimension of the class uh, uh, of a class of function by using the structure of the dual class of functions. Okay, and um, recall, so we are motivated by data driven algorithm design. So we're interested in bounding the pseudo dimension of the function class u alpha, where u alpha is the utility function of a given algorithm alpha is the value over the possible input, is, input instances i. And uh, again, we observe that in many cases, the dual functions u i of alpha will function for a function the dual i fix an instance i, that vary the parameter alpha. And you notice that for many uh, case studies, this utility function, these dual functions, uh, or I fix an instance of the parameters or piecewise structure. So formally, let's assume that if for any function the dual or that I fix an instance I and vary the parameters alpha, 
I can uh, partition the parameter space with at most n boundary functions that comes from a, uh, from a fixed function class f, so that inside each of the region defined by these boundary functions, like this blue region or this uh, uh, green region or this red region. So we also assume that inside each of the regions defined by these boundary functions, there exists uh, the utility function corresponds to, uh, to, to a simple function from a, uh, from a function class G. Right, so inside each of these regions, uh, say this blue region, there exists a function G from a simpler function class G such that the utility in the region equals uh, UI of alpha equals G of alpha. Right, so imagine that the dual functions are piecewise structured in this sense, then we are able to provide the uh, bound and the two dimension of the primal class of functions as a function of how complex the boundary functions are and how complex these functions in the function class G inside each of the piece are. So in particular, the two dimension of the primal class of functions is upper bounded by the two dimension of B F uh, is upper bounded by uh, yeah the D F star plus D G star uh, times log of D F star plus D G star plus D F star times log n, where D F star is the least dimension of the dual class of functions of the least boundary functions, and D G star is the two dimension of the dual of uh, the function class G, and n is an upper bound on the number of boundary functions. Okay, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the proof. Uh, as I said, once you have the right level of abstraction, the proof falls naturally. And the, few, the two key insights in the proof are the following. So we know from uh, a, a kind of a basic fact in Lani theory, we know that if we, pick, if we have a function class F and if we fix n points, we can bound the number of labeling of these points by function in the function class by using so-called Sauer's lemma in terms of the basic dimension of F. That's one key fact well known. Another fact turns out, which is an interesting fact, is that if we have a function class f and we fix n functions, like I had the boundary functions in my structure result, and if I fix n of these functions, and if I want to bound the number of regions induced, turns out that there is a direct correspondence between the shattering coefficient for the dual and the number of regions induced by these functions. So again, I can bound the number of regions induced by using Sauer's lemma, but now in terms of the least dimension of the dual of uh, the function class f which I, I know it here by F star. Okay, now with these two key observations, I'm ready to tell you uh, a high level uh, version of the proof uh, of this general sample complexity result. So we assume that, you know, we are trying to bound the dimension of the primal class of functions, and we assume that each function, the dual is piecewise structured. Okay, and so I want to give an upper bound on the uh, dimension of the primal class of functions. So to do so, we need to understand if we fix the instances i1, so if I fix this uh, the instances i1, i2, id, and the threshold z1, z2, zd, I need to be able to bound the number of sign patterns induced by uh, uh, these instances. Okay, so I need to uh, right. I need to be able to bound the number of sign patterns uh, induced uh, on these instances as I as I range over all possible parameters alpha. Right, so I fix the instances i1, y2, id, I fix thresholds z1, z2, zd, and I want to bound uh, the number of sign patterns induced by the utility functions of my algorithms on these instances. Okay, but equivalently, this is the number of sign patterns induced by these dual functions, u i1 of alpha, u id of alpha, as I vary alpha. Now, by now, I can bound the number of regions induced by, uh, uh, in, uh, induced uh, in the parameter space by these dual functions. And I can bound them uh, uh, by using the least dimension of the dual of the boundary functions. And so I give it the number of regions induced by these dual functions is E n to the uh, times D to the power of D F star, or D F star is a, uh, uh, the DC dimension of the um, uh, dual of the boundary functions. But now on each region, I know that these utility functions uh, on all the points are given by uh, the functions from the function class G. And so I can use it to then bound the number of sign patterns within each region. I use further dual tricks and I can bound the number of sign patterns in, this, in each region. And then by multiplying both of these quantities, I then can get an upper bound on the number of uh, sign patterns induced, um, the number of above below patterns induced on these D instances, which is E n times D to the power of D F star times E times D to the power of D G star. And then, you know, to finish the proof, I use a usual trick where I just remember the fact that, you know, the absolute dimension is the largest D 
for which I can get an exponential number of uh, sign patterns uh, on my instances. You know, so then I have to do is to solve d to, to the d is upper bounded by this quantity here, solve for d, and then I get uh, the bound on the two dimension of the original primal class of functions. Okay, and again, the exciting fact is that when this uh, then applies, this result, this result then applies to a variety of uh, data driven algorithm design uh, problems. So once you get this uh, sample complexity result, we can then use it to, to derive generalization guarantees, sample complexity guarantees for many uh, data driven algorithm design problems in the distributional learning uh, formalization. This includes NEPSEC problem that I mentioned, the real clustering problems. Um, solving exchanger programs uh, by using branch and bound uh, and so on. Okay, great. Now I have, uh, I was looking at the time, I have 10 more minutes left or so. So uh, I want to also uh, discuss um, another interesting uh, formulation, which is the online algorithm selection. So, uh, which is uh, relevant to the case where the instances arrive online and one by one. So, so far we discussed a case where we're given all the instances at once, but what if they come online? Then in that case, what we want to do is we want to achieve no regret guarantees, meaning that we want to show what the Cumulative performance of our learning procedure is comparable to the performance of the best algorithm in, from the family in hindsight. Now, uh, the challenge is that these uh, utility functions um, coming from data driven algorithm design are very volatile. They can have many sharp discontinuities. And so we cannot apply existing techniques from online learning theory, but the major contribution in this uh, couple of papers mentioned on the slide is to identify general properties um of these utility functions uh to, that are sufficient to show no regular guarantees and at the high level and i'll discuss this in detail in a bit we show that if the functions these, these utility functions are piecewise lipschitz and they have dispersed discontinuities then no regret is possible okay to 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 present this a little bit more formally so in the online learning algorithm selection problem we go in in rounds uh in each round we select um, uh, 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 parameter, so it's like a parameter alpha t, usually corresponds to an algorithm in the algorithm, uh, selection problem, and while an adversary picks uh, a, uh, a piecewise Lipschitz function, which corresponds to some problem instance, and it induces the uh, scoring fun utility function. Then we receive uh, uh, the score, the utility for the parameter alpha t that is selected, and in the full information setting, uh, we are uh, we get to observe the full scoring function, or at least to evaluate it at the point of our own choice, uh, while in the bandy setting, we only observe the payoff of the uh, of the uh, parameter alpha t that we picked. Here should be UT of alpha t. Ideally, should have UT of alpha t. And then uh, this going around, and then our goal uh, goes over capital T rounds, and then our goal is to minimize regret, which is a gap between the performance of the best parameter in hindsight and our cumulative performance. Now, uh, the typical uh, regret bounds we get, um, now in the classic case where the number of parameters is finite or maybe the utility functions are linear or convex, a strategy that leads to good regret bounds is so-called exponential weight, where we select um, a parameter in round t, we select a parameter uh, alpha t with property that is uh, based on its cumulative performance so far, and in particular exponential in the performance. And then the typical regret bounds we get, um, so, which is, so again, what is a regret bound is the difference between the cumulative performance of the algorithm, of our learning algorithm, and the best uh, uh, algorithm from the family, the performance of the best algorithm from the family in hindsight. And this typical regret bound grows like um, roughly square root of t times some factors that depend on the problem. And which that means, right, so the typical regret guarantee is of this one here. Uh, and that means that if we divide uh, by t, then we get that the per round average performance of our learning algorithms uh, approaches the performance of the best parameter in hindsight or the best algorithm in, uh, from the family in hindsight at, that, uh, at a rate that is of the order one over square root of t. Now, unfortunately, once we get discontinuities, as we've seen happens in utility, uh, when we want to look at utility functions that come from the data driven algorithm design, it turns out that you can show that getting no regret is actually impossible. Um, So basically, to achieve no regret, we need an additional structural condition. 
And what we prove in our work is that uh, a condition called dispersion is sufficient to achieve low regret, uh, to achieve actually no regret. And what dispersion means, it means that if we consider all our uh, all the utility functions given by uh, our algorithms up to the uh, that we picked up to the current moment. So if we consider all uh, our uh, the utility functions in the corresponding piecewise Lipschitz utility functions, what we want is that in any interval of with W, um, at most K of, uh, of the utility functions have boundaries in that interval. In general, basically what we want is that in any interval of with W or more generally in any ball uh, of radius W, L2 ball of radius W, at most K the utility functions have boundaries inside the ball. Okay, if that, if that happens, then we're going to say that the, the functions are WK dispersed. Otherwise, they are not dispersed, right? So, for example, pictorially, this, uh, this case is one where you have dispersion, and this case, it's not dispersed because we have too many boundaries within certain small ball. But we're, what we're able to show is that if we are WK dispersed, so we say informally, what we're able to show that if dispersion holds, then we can use uh, basically a continuous version of the uh, weighted majority algorithm or the exponentially weighted forecaster to then show no regret, which looks again at the order that we are used to square root of t times d uh, regret. And so more specifically, right, if we uh, if, if we use this exponentially weighted forecaster when we round t, we select alpha t from a probability distribution from this exponentially prob exponential probability distribution or the exponent for parameter alpha we have ut of alpha, which is the total payoff of parameter alpha up to time t. So this is the way we sample uh, uh, the alpha t at round. Uh, this is a, the sampling probability at round t, right? If alpha t, we sample alpha t from this uh, distribution. Um, then we're able to show that if the utility functions u1, u2, and so on, u capital t, or the utility functions of the algorithms we picked up to this moment, have the property that there are piecewise Lipschitz and wk dispersed, when the regret we get is only of the orders h, where h is an upper bound on, uh, on the range of the utility function, square root of t times theta uh, plus k, all of that plus, oops, all of that plus plw. And turns out that if you, uh, for many problems, we you can set uh, w to be uh, one over square root of t, and k to be square root of t times the function of the problem. And then when you work it out, you get that the regret is of your the square root of t times t times some function of the problem. So it really recovers the regret from the simpler case of uh, linear functions, linear utility functions, convex utility functions, and so on. Those being classic cases. OK, and I only have a couple more minutes left, so I'm to quickly, very, very briefly go through the uh through the proof so uh not, not focusing on details but more on uh, high level uh, structure of the proof so we want to show that if the utility functions u1 u2 u t that are these are the corresponding utility functions encounter online if are ellipsheets and wk dispersed then the regret is of the form that i have here on the slide right where so which rf is speaking square root of t times t plus k all that multiplies by h plus tlw Okay, and to analyze the uh, basically the uh, to to, to prove the, the the proof structure here is as follows. So the key idea is a classic idea. The same proof follows in the simpler case, and the utility functions are much more nice. So what we're going to do, we're going to track the total weight in the system. What's the total weight in the system is this normalization factor. How this normalization factor in round t changes, right? So this wp was a normalization factor for my distribution pt. So and I want to track how that changes and in particular what we're going to do we're going to come up with upper and lower bounds on wt plus one over w1 uh, w capital t plus one over w1 or capital t is the last round and for the upper bound is this is really just a classic uh, the, uh, it's classic we're going to reload the algorithm performance with the magnitude of the update and then we can get an upper bound on wt plus one over w1 but where the upper bound involves the expected total health or our learning algorithm this is just very, uh, the proof follows what the same structure as for, the, say, the convex case. Uh, for the lower bound, this is where we're going to use dispersion. So we're going to use now in the lower bound, we're going to use that, uh, you know, that our utility functions are dispersed. So, when to come up, uh, so we're going to use the fact that by using dispersion, I'm able to show that if alpha, if alpha star is the optimal parameter in hindsight, so imagine that alpha star is the best algorithm in hindsight. Uh, the best algorithm from the feminine high center, the best, the corresponding, let's think about alpha star, its corresponding optimal parameter, 
We're able to show that for all alpha in a ball of radius W around alpha star, we have that uh, the total utility up to moment T of, of any such algorithm uh, parameterized by alpha is lower bound by the total utility of the algorithm parameterized by alpha star minus HK minus TLW. And really this falls on the fact that at most of the functions have discontinuities in the ball by the definition of dispersion and the range here is zero H. And really uh, the remaining functions that don't have discontinuities are Lipschitz. Right, so we can basically come up with this lower bound on the utility function of any parameter, the total, the total utility of uh, any algorithm from the uh, parameterized by alpha, which is close to alpha star, gets up to uh, uh, up to moment t, and then this can be used to then get the lower bound on uh, on w t plus one, the total weight in the system of moment t plus one, and which again can be used to get the lower bound on w t plus one over w one. You know, and this lower bound, uh, not luckily, relates to the performance of the best fixed algorithm in hindsight, right? In this right-hand side, I have UT plus one, UT plus one of alpha star, which is a total pay over the best algorithm in hindsight is gotten. And now combining the upper and lower bounds on WT plus one over W1, you know, I get now getting an equality, you know, uh, use the fact that the performance of the algorithm, uh, uh, the, the cumulative performance of the algorithm is at most H times T, um and then you know just uh using that rearranging green standard tricks setting the right learning rate you know because uh in my i had an implicit real learning rate lambda you know then i get the final regret desired regret guarantee okay and then what we're able to show so uh, i only have one minute left so so we're able to show that if the utility functions are dispersed then we get no regular guarantees and moreover, we're then able to show that in many interesting cases coming from the Daddy Mangles design, we also are able to prove dispersion guarantees. So, for example, for the knapsack problem, if the, the sizes and the values of each of the items in the knapsack are, uh, say, uh, drawn from a bay bounded distribution, then we get dispersion, uh, which is of the right order. You know, that then leads to the get of the order squared of t times d for the corresponding online algorithm selection. Okay, and in a, an, another uh, couple of, and in our work, in addition to specific examples, we also provide some general tools for analyzing dispersion when the input of the of the utility functions in these algorithms, given that the input instances are small. Okay, so to summarize, so um, going back at the high level, so the main motivation for this line of work was uh, to think about data driven algorithm design. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, data design can help us overcome major shortcomings of classic algorithm design by adapting the algorithm to the domain at hand. And this is motivated by, by the fact that different methods, different algorithm methods are better in different settings. And um, so it's very natural to try to, to, to put down a parametric family of algorithms and to learn an algorithm from the family that does best over a given domain, rather than wondering about performance in worst case instances. Uh, you know, uh, this has this approach has been used in practice for a while. Uh, you know, our work in the past few years has helped lay foundations, formal theoretical foundations for data driven algorithm design. And we looked at both at case, case studies, specific algorithm problems coming from specific domains, and also, uh, uh, and in addition to doing that, uh, we are also able to abstract some general analysis principles that are hopefully very broadly applicable. And uh, as we've seen, hopefully in this talk today, these general analysis principles, you know, sample complexity results in terms of the structure of the dual class of functions or, you know, or online learning results when the, the corresponding utility functions are very unstructured, in particular, they're only piecewise Lipschitz, but, you know, they have dispersed discontinuity. So the hope is that these general analysis tools can help us, uh, you know, expand the frontiers of machine learning as well. And, you know, they would apply even beyond the data-driven algorithm design, which was our original motivation. And I'm hoping that uh, several, many more of you are going to help us, will, will join us in uh, analyzing data driven algorithms uh, and also expanding the frontiers of machine learning theory. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Maria, for this uh, beautiful and illuminating talk. Um, I guess we don't have, as we said, time for questions, so please join. And Nina for, uh, at the Discord channel for uh, for questions and answers. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining. Thank you.